love with all my heart. Floyd Baker, it is good to see you here on Easter Sunday, brother. Thank you for coming and joining us this morning. As you well know, I'm not your pastor, so I can get by with a few things, right? You can't dock my pay, can't do anything like that. We are going to stand and begin worship by looking at Scripture. And out of God's reverence to his word, I'm going to ask that you stand with me this morning and, wa and listen to what the reading is in Luke. Stand with me at this time, please. In Luke chapter 24, verse 1, it says, But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. <laughs> and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And while they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and they bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee? that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all those things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter, he rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves. And he went home marveling at what had happened. I hope this morning you too have looked in the tomb and realized he is not there. Amen. Amen? Yeah. We have a very, very special service. I ask you to be seated and join in the celebration of one <laughs> special, special young lady in her baptism this morning. Good morning. Good morning. We're so glad you've made it to this uh, uh, to church here with us this beautiful Easter Sunday where we will exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. And on this day, this uh, first thing we're going to do is we're going to baptize Rachel Marshall. And she is, uh, she, this is about what Jesus has done in her, isn't it? That's exactly what this is about. This is about what Christ has done in her. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to invite her to come down in the water. And when she comes, her daddy's going to come. Uh, he's been licensed to preach here. And one of these days, Jason's probably going to be a minister. I believe God's called him to that. And we're going to invite him down here, and he's going to charge Rachel before we baptize her. Would you guys uh, uh, please welcome the men? Come on, guys. And so as they make their way down into the baptismal pool, let us be reminded that this is one of two, one of the only two pictures, ordained pictures that God gives us to see uh, Jesus in, isn't it? So we see the crucified Savior as, as Rachel stands in the water, in the cold water, right, baby? <laughs> and, uh, uh, and then we see her buried. And then we see her raised from the dead. Come over here and stand on this, sweetie. And so we're looking for that. Come here, watch, watch your foot, watch your foot. There you go. I'm going to give this to Jason. Jason, you have some questions to ask her. I do. And I got to tell you, it is the greatest feeling a father can have to know that the Lord has drawn his child to salvation. Yes, that's right. Because the Lord is, you know, I'm her father, but I'm not really her father. Yeah. Jesus, God is her father. Yes. So, Rachel... Do you believe that you were a sinner and that you needed saved from your sins? Yes. Do you believe that Jesus died on the cross to save you from your sins? Yes. Um, in accordance with Romans 10, do you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead? Yes. And would you like to live your whole life in service to him? Yes. Telling others about him? Yes. Okay. Will you pray for your daughter? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you have drawn her to salvation. We thank you that you have saved her. Father, I pray that you would uh, 
hold her in your hand as you said that you would. You said that no one will snatch us from your hand. Pray that you would keep her and, and guide her and continue to train her up in the way that she should go. And that you would give Deidre and I wisdom as to how to continue to train her as she grows. I thank you for honoring, uh, honoring the, the promise we made when we had her dedicated that we would raise her in the fear and admonition of you. We thank you for today. And we ask you to continue to bless us and to bless the church through this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, in accordance with this, uh, and upon your profession of faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let's stand together and sing a great hymn. What is it? 130? 160. 160. 160. Thank you. you. may be seated. Wasn't that beautiful? And we are so thankful for uh, uh, Jason and, and Deidre and the family. Uh, we love them very much, and we're so happy uh, that God has called Rachel to salvation, and we give thanks for that. We're going to go and take our second scripture reading from the book of Hebrews, chapter uh, 10. Um, as you're turning there, if you'd like to, and you can have a pew Bible, or if you have your own Bible, or you can look on, on the screen. I think, we, yeah, we do have them on the screen. That uh, as you're turning there and making your way, we are excited to announce that this Friday we have Secret Church here at the church. We want you to join us. We'll be downstairs. It'll be intense Bible study led by David Platt uh, on the simulcast 
from 7 to 1 a.m. It's this Friday. We're so looking forward to that. And then this time next week, we begin our spring revival conference. Uh, and it's on the pillars of the church. And every evening, we're going to have a great, you know, great preacher and great preaching and a great sermon. We hope that you're looking forward to this and wanting to be a part because these are things that grow us up as a church uh, together. So please uh, have those things in mind and be in prayer for those things as time approaches. So let's read, the, read, the, what, read what God's Word has to say here as we go down to uh, verse 8. It says, When he said above, You have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then he added, Behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that we will have been sanctified. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Jesus Christ offered for all time a single sacrifice for sin, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. So in the Old Testament, they sacrificed over and over again, didn't they? Year after year after year. But Jesus is so sufficient. One sacrifice, his death, has, his, his blood was shed for us uh, for the forgiveness of our sins, past, present, and future. Put your trust on Christ. I want to read from uh, the 1689 London Baptist Confession, chapter 11, paragraph 3, uh, on justification. Uh, as we make our way to that and see what, the, what our confession has to say in accordance with the scriptures. And it says this, By his obedience and death, Christ fully paid the debt of all those who are justified. He endured in their place the penalty they deserved. By this sacrifice of himself in his shed blood on the cross, he legitimately, really, and fully satisfied God's justice on their behalf. Yet their justification is based entirely on free grace because he was given by the Father for them and his obedience and satisfaction were accepted in their place. These things were done freely, not because of anything in us, so that both the exact justice and the rich grace of God would be glorified in the justification of sinners. Good news. If you trust in Jesus Christ as your only Savior and Lord, if you believe only in Him and look to Him for the forgiveness of your sins, not only are you forgiven, but eternal life is yours. His obedience becomes your obedience. What you have to have to get into heaven with, and be with God the Father becomes yours through justification. And it's all in Christ alone. Our choir is going to sing in Christ alone, but the words are going to be on the video board. You know the hymn. Sing it with us. I'm sorry. What is it? The sand board. This, the, so can we sing? From the okay, very good. I need All the right. choir members that's sitting out there to please come up, please. Let's make oh, it. So that's what we're doing. I, <laughs> Sorry. I, I was wanting to get your attention before you said that. Yeah, I'm in business. <laughs> I know.
things happen, don't they? Well, let's, uh, yeah, we can do it. Let's uh, give thanks to our great God in heaven. He's given us every good thing, and it's a time for us to worship him with the giving of tithes and offerings. The Lord has given us every good thing, and uh, because he's given us all good things, then it's appropriate for us to worship him as we give back to him. Let's uh, have our deacons come forward for the morning offering. Let's all stand and give thanks together as we sing the doxology. Please remain standing. Uh, actually, let's go ahead and have a seat. You may be seated. But as you remember in prayer, uh, as you pray, please remember John Markham, who has a kidney stone. Please remember him in prayer. Okay, at this time, let's, uh, I think we have our little cherub choir, right? It's time for our cherub choir.
This is a life, a life forevermore. A life, a life, a life forevermore. My Jesus is alive. Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah. My Jesus is alive forevermore. Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah. My Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive, alive forevermore. Alive, alive, alive forevermore. My Jesus is alive. Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah. My Jesus is alive forevermore. Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah. My Jesus is alive. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Glorify the name, glorify the name, glorify the name of the Lord. Glorify the name. Very good, baby. Good job. Good job, Taylor. All right. Um, let's do... Uh, I'm going to have you stand one more time because we're going to say the Lord's Prayer together. But before we do, I'm going to give you an opportunity. Those of you who can, please stand. Uh, I'm going to give you an opportunity to repent, to confess your sins before our great God in heaven. It's a fact that we've all come here as sinners, right? And we're in need of the forgiveness of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I want to give you just a moment to ask for forgiveness, and then, I'm gonna, then we're going to pray the Lord's Prayer together. It's a fact, church, that our sins are many, but His mercy is more. And we give thanks for that. And those of you, I want you to know that if you come to the Lord Jesus Christ 
and you repent of your sins and you confess those things before him, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. And uh, as we're being seated, let's sing Jesus Loves Me as John and the little children come. Rachel wanted, wanted to share that she was excited about being baptized this morning. And Rachel, let me tell you, we were excited as a church to get to witness that. I, I have something and, and uh, has nothing to do with Easter. But somebody three years ago gave me this. And it was given to me by Rachel. And it was a drawing she did on a Sunday morning. And I told Rachel, I will always keep this in my Bible. I do what I say I'll do. And this was done on the 12th of June in 2016. It was three years ago. And the reason I say that is, one of the things of, that, that I mean this, you all mean so much to me. You mean so much to this, your families, but to this church. And when we get to celebrate something like a baptism, we all rejoice in that. We really, really do so. Bless you, because God has wonderful things in store for Rachel in her life. She, he really, truly does. And Mama and Daddy, thank you all as well. Now, Easter. Hey, anything? Hi there. Here are you, handsome. Anything exciting today going on? No, no, okay. What do we have going on? Um, we are celebrating Jesus waking up from his death. Amen. Raising up from his death. That's right. We're celebrating that today. Now, let me tell you how far back I go. Uh, would you believe when you all were singing this morning that at one time I was a cherub? I was a cherub. I chirped in this church. Uh, didn't sing very good, but I chirped in the church. And I had a, we, you know what we used to sing in? We used to sing in little white robes with big black bow ties. You all remember those? Anybody remember those? God, I am dating myself, aren't I? But uh, we would stand up on Easter Sunday morning and do what you guys did, and you all did such a better job than what we did. But it's Easter, and we get excited about Easter and, and other things going on. But I want to share something. When I was young, maybe you all haven't seen this yet, but at school, there used to have assemblies when I was in grade school, okay? And one of my favorite assemblies was the magician. Have you all ever had a magician come to your school? Nope, okay. Shows you again how old I am, okay? Does anybody back there remember when the magicians came to school? Lynn, thank you so much, okay. And the magicians would come and they'd do their magic, right? And they never really believed in the magic, but they always had this really neat trick that I always wanted to know how they did it, they always, me and they had this pretty lady with him, all right? And he'd take the pretty lady and he'd put, him a, put her in a trunk, okay? And invariably, you know what would happen to the lady? What? She'd disappear. And all of us would be kind of figuring, well, wow, where'd she go? Where'd she go? Where'd she go? And then he'd do his thing, open the trunk, let us see that she wasn't there. And then you know what happened? He'd close the trunk back, he'd do his little thing, and all of a sudden, the lady would come back. And everybody would just, hey, great shit. Great, great trick, right? You all would not be impressed with that today, but trust me, 55, 60 years ago, that was pretty impressive stuff, okay? So now, let's get to where we're going with that one. That was a trick. 
Didn't need, wasn't true, nothing going on. It was a trick. But let's look about what happened in history some 2,000 years ago. Wes, if you would put up, let me read this to you. It says, now after the Sabbath, now the Sabbath was the Sunday, toward the dawn of the first of the week, Mary and Magdalene and the other Mary went to the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from the heaven and came, rolled back the stone and sat on it. Think about that. His appearance, now this is the angel, was like lightning and his clothing was white as snow. And for fear of him, now these were Roman guards, these, were, these guys were fearless, but they trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the woman, or women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He's not here, for he has risen, and he said, come. The angel says, come and see the place where he lays. Now, you know, that trick that the magician did was just a trick. There wasn't anything unique about that. But what happened many years ago when Jesus talked about the fact that he was going to die upon the cross, he also said, what, I'm going to be rose from the grave in three days? See, Jesus did something very miraculous, only that God could ordain, and he touched that so that Jesus Stone was rolled away, and he came forth from death. Now, he didn't do that so that we could see that he escaped. He did that so we could see in that he had risen. Amen. See, today is a day of celebration. The day is the day that Jesus, we celebrate his res resurrection. It's nothing anymore. It's... I, Love to hide eggs, love to do that. But there's one thing we can't forget. We can't get, forget the cross. We can't get, forget the death. And we must not ever, ever forget the resurrection. Okay? That's what Easter is all about. So as we celebrate that today, let's remember that. Thank you for being here. Thank you for what you mean to this church. Thank you for what you mean to your families. And thank you, each of you, what you mean to your Heavenly Father. Okay, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this Easter celebration. We thank you for this Resurrection Day, a day in which we celebrate truly life over death. And for each believer, the assurance of knowing that when this earthly life passes away, that our life just begins in the presence of of celebration and worship of your son, Jesus. Father, thank you. Thank you for this church family. Thank you for each one here this morning. Father, you know the needs of each one here. Father, I ask that you would meet those needs so that it would bring you honor and glory. In Christ's name, amen. And we have something to help you remember what this is all about. So if you go see Miss Leanne, she has something for you. All right, Bruce, I like this shirt. Be blessed by the truth of this song.
pleased that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ has conquered death, hasn't he? If you have your copy of God's Word, please turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. And uh, in haste, I left my glasses today, so hopefully I can read it. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know if that might uh, really magnify it, might it? Luke 24, and we're going to be down to verse uh, 36. That's where we'll go. Uh, man, what a day to be here in church and see a baptism and sing of the risen Lord Jesus, right? Uh, to hear the gospel preached is what we're going to do. 
you know, that Christ died for sinners and uh, that he rose for our justification. He died for you, you know, that's what we're going to hear today. Verse 36, as they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled and why do, your, why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it, is, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they, were, while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish. And he took it and ate it before them. And then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sin should be reclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and behold, I am sending you the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And while he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising God. Amen. Will you uh, bow your heads with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we pray your blessing upon the reading of this word and the preaching of the word. I pray, God, that truth will be proclaimed. Lord, that sinners uh, who are in need of repentance and the forgiveness of their sins may come and repent and trust Christ alone for their salvation. May everyone leaves here today know that there is nothing in their lives, no sin that they've committed that Jesus will not forgive. Help them to know that there's a Savior who is far greater than the sins that they've sinned. And Lord, may you bless this. To the Father, I praise, I give praise. To the Father who has called a people of his own, who has sent the Savior. I, to, we give praise to the Son who has redeemed a people of his own. And we give praise to the Spirit, the triune God in heaven, uh, who brings us. Uh, to Christ. This we pray in Jesus' precious and holy name. And amen. We uh, come here to this highest, this highest day of the year uh, for the church of Jesus Christ. Um, it's the holiest day uh, of the year. Um, um, and on this day, we take time to look at a passage uh, out of Luke that gives us the story of the resurrection. We ought to begin by saying from the beginning that the disciples, that as they find out that Jesus has been, uh, is not in the tomb, they are as absolutely shocked uh, as they can be. And, this is, and the reason is, is because they had totally misunderstood uh, the mission and work of Jesus Christ. They had thought of him setting up an earthly kingdom. Uh, they thought that he would come and you know, rid the... Uh, the uh, Judea of all of the Roman soldiers and all of Rome and that he would rule and, uh, for a thousand years and all this other stuff. They, they thought all that was going to happen and when uh, that didn't happen and when he was crucified and they were absolutely devastated. And they thought that this was the end of Jesus. They thought that perhaps they, they had wasted their time in following uh, him and what were they going to do now? Where were they going to go? This is a group of disciples in disarray. They're in disappointment. And even though they had heard Jesus say from time to time, that, you know, it wasn't like he hadn't said this before, that he was going to be betrayed and that he was going to be handed over to the, to the chief priest, that he was going to be crucified and then he was going to raise from the dead. They still missed somehow what Jesus had come for. You see, he had not come to deliver Israel from the oppressive rule of the Roman Empire. As great a thing as that would be, it would have been wonderful, it would have been amazing, it would have all of that other stuff, but it was small potatoes compared to what he had really come to do. You know what he'd come to do? Bigger things than that. To defeat the devil, to defeat death, to defeat hell and the grave. That's what Jesus came for. To conquer your sin, to raise people up from death. That's what he came to do. Um... And anyone today that is disappointed in having come to Jesus is only disappointed because they have misunderstood the nature of what Jesus has come to do. Because Jesus hasn't come for earthly things. Now, there are earthly benefits. I do not deny that. 
But I'm, I'm just telling you today, he has not come to fix our marriages or help us with our troubled teens. Um, he hasn't come to make sure that we're successful or wealthy. He hasn't come for earthly things. And if we have come to Jesus for these worldly things, then we are presently in idolatry. And we need to come to him for forgiveness of our sins and for him to reconcile us to God. Because if we come to Jesus for him, that's what we're supposed to come for, not for the gifts that he can give us. And so I hope that I don't disappoint you today because if it does, you're still in your sins. But if you come to him for him, you'll never be disappointed. Never be disappointed. We want to take some time and walk back to this passage and, and consider what God would teach us in these verses. Beginning in verse 36, we have our dejected disciples. They're gathering together. And if you read John's account of the gospel reading there, he says the doors were locked. And they've been living in fear because Jesus was crucified. And now maybe they're next. They don't know what's going to happen next. They're, they're afraid. So they gather under cover in a room with locked doors. They're cowering in fear. They have no idea what's going to happen. They're scared to death. And all of a sudden, Jesus shows up among them. And it doesn't seem that he went through... He said, what's not happening? He didn't go through walls like a ghost. That would be inconsistent with him being a resurrected body. However, shows us that locked doors are not a problem for Jesus, right? <laughs> Can't lock him out. Um, surely they were startled. And then Jesus says, peace to you. There. Now, there's a depth to that statement. It's not, it's, 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 it's not just a greeting. You know, Jesus isn't just calming them down. You know, I've startled you. Oh, oh calm down, Peace. Be with you. That's not what it is. He's pronouncing a blessing of peace over them. They've been reconciled to God through the death and resurrection of Jesus. You understand that, that, once, that at one time God was at war with mankind. And Jesus now has taken the wrath of God for their sins. And he's brought them peace, hasn't he? That's what, God, that's what Christ came to do. Now, I don't know if, 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 you guys, if, many, if all of you understand this. But that in your sins, God's at war with you. You're in rebellion. You've broken his laws. And you have no hope. You have no hope unless God sends a Savior. And he has sent a Savior in Jesus Christ to reconcile you to God. To get you peace with the God in heaven. You know, let me ask you something. If you go to war with God, who's going to win? That's, that's not going to come out good for you, is it? But Jesus, when he was on the cross, took the wrath of God for your sin. And that's why he comes here and he says... Peace be to you. He's saying, I've reconciled you to the Father. I've made peace for you. Have you understood that in your sins you were at war with God? That you were a rebel against His rightful rule and authority? That you've not been left in that awful condition that Jesus came and bore the result of God's war with sinners? And because of that, you now have peace with God. You can go into His presence now because Jesus brought you peace. Let's go back to verse 38. It says in verse 38, he says, And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do, you, do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still believed for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of boiled fish, and he took it and ate it before them. Now I want to approach these verses from an apologetic angle. Uh, that is to say, from the angle providing a, a defense of the gospel for, uh, for, to the skeptics. Because there are many skeptics in the world today. I don't know if you've seen some of the recent data out there, uh, but there's an incredible rise of people affiliated with no religion and an increasing number of people that consider themselves agnostic. In fact, the numbers doubled in 20 years. And pretty soon, when they take the next, when they take the next polling data on this. Uh, those, those people who say no religion will outnumber people who say that, there are, uh, that they are affiliated with religion. But I would say to anyone who's a skeptic today, you know, I don't know about this Jesus stuff that he rose from the dead. It seems kind of hard to believe. But I would say this to you. The resurrection of Jesus is, t is tended with many infallible proofs. You know, sometimes what you'll hear from people is say, well, listen, you, you, need, to, you, need, to, you need to not, you, don't, you know, you're, you're, you're thinking too much. You need to quit thinking. You need to just trust in Jesus and all that stuff. You need to quit thinking. As if we're supposed to disconnect our head from our body uh, and pretend that, uh, uh, you know, and get away from reality and all that other stuff. No, I would say, I would never say to you, 
disconnect your head from your body. I would say to you, you need your head connected to your body so that you can sort through these things. You're reasonable people, aren't you? You're reasonable people. And we can sit here and talk about the evidence of these things and you can come to a reasonable decision for yourself, can't you? That's what I believe about you. I don't have to tell you disconnect your head from your body. That's the last thing that you need to do. Uh, and, and there's no doubt that to believe in the gospel message for salvation, which is more than just to believe it as a fact of history, because there are a lot of people who believe it as a fact of history that aren't saved, uh, is different than being called by God to believe. I understand that. That's a gift of faith by Him. But there are some who have hardened their hearts to the truth of God's Word who need to hear what they've never considered. Why is it that you think, uh, do you think that Christianity became the largest religion in the world? Do you think that it's because some people have just needed something to believe in to give them hope after, after death? Or maybe you think, well, Christianity, uh, they forced people. No, they didn't. Christianity, Christianity, especially for that first 300 years, all it did, it, it, was, it was oppressed by the sword. They tried to kill it out. The devil tried to kill Christianity. Rome tried to kill Christianity. But it couldn't happen because God was behind it. See, Christianity would have never made it without the work of God. Here is this band, and let me just put it to you this way. Here's this band of misfit disciples, and they spent three years with Jesus. They totally missed what he was teaching concerning the purpose for which he came. He is crucified. They are dejected. They're worried they're next. And then the next thing you know, they're out there boldly proclaiming the, 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 the crucified and risen Lord Jesus Christ in the midst of threats of jail and even that their own lives would be taken from them. Now, what changed? I'll tell you what changed. They saw the risen Jesus Christ. They felt the wounds in his hands and in his side. He told them, peace be to you. Now, what should that do to them? Here's, here's the deal. When you find out that death can't even hold you, it gives you the boldness to stare straight at it, doesn't it? Well, what can, what can he do to me? You know, what can they do to me? Kill me and send me to, to go and be with God and with Jesus? What can they do? I have already know what's, what, what happens here. And I'm telling you that if you're unsure about the reality or the reliability of the testimony of the disciples, you need to think things through. Someone say that they've made up a story about a resurrected Savior to counter the embarrassment that they had for, after, for following a failed teacher. You know. But the problem with that argument is that when the rubber really hits the road, uh, 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 as a result of your, li of your lie. That's the problem. When the rubber hits the road, when, when it's all fun and games until they start threatening you with death, right? When they start telling you they're going to put you in prison. And then the truth starts to come back to you. You know what? We made it all up. I mean, wouldn't that what you would say if you made it up? If they was ready to kill you, what would you say? Okay, hold on. I give up. It's all lies. You start to rethink your life choices, don't you? But what became of these disciples? I don't know. Maybe you don't even know what happened to these disciples. Maybe you don't know that. History says 11 out of the 12 were martyred. Martyred. They died. Violent deaths for teaching that Jesus is the crucified and risen Savior. And you know the one that wasn't martyred? You know what they did to him? It was John. They threw him in boiling oil and he lived. So then they just said, well, we want you out of here. So they, they sent him out to Patmos and told him, said, you know, you stay there. We don't want anything to do with you. See, you don't die for a lie. You know, maybe, I don't know, maybe a couple people are crazy enough to die for it, uh, although I doubt it. So I'll give you a couple. How about that? But all of them, and at different times, you know, in the, the 40s, in the 50s, in the 60s, and in the 90s, they all, you know, I mean, it's like they all gather us up. Oh, we'll just, we'll just go ahead and all go to death together. No, it was decades apart, some of them, from dying. In faraway countries, Thomas died in India. And would you, uh, would you make a story up? So here you are writing this, right? Would you make a story up that makes you out to be the clown? You know? Because the disciples are clowns, aren't they? I mean, that's, that's all they are. They're like, oh, we, you know, we don't get it. And, and they look like dummies, don't they? I mean, would you do that? What would you do if you were making the story up? Oh, I'd make myself out to be the hero, wouldn't you? you know, nobody else believed, but I tell you, I did. No, what do you have, Peter? The, the, Mark is basically his gospel. His cousin, John Mark, wrote the gospel of Mark, and Peter gives him all that information. What's Peter tell you? The same thing. He denied the Lord three times. 
They're clowns. You wouldn't, you wouldn't make the story up. How about this? If you were making the story up, would you say that women were the first witnesses of the resurrection? Now listen, I say that not from this 21st century because you can't say that around here any nowadays, can you? No, I'm talking 2,000 years ago when, women, when, women, when the testimony of women wasn't even admissible in court. That's what I'm talking about. They had to tell the truth, didn't they? You see what Jesus did? You see what God did? These are little things, but they're big things, aren't they? We think of them little, but they're actually big. Many infallible proofs for you. And so the very nature of the embarrassment of the disciples in their testimony, the fact that they were all willing to die violently for this story and not with a sword in their hand, because that's not what they did, but with the simple message of Christ crucified for sinners on their lips demands that you give this deep, deep consideration. You cannot pass it off. You cannot say, oh, it's no big deal. You can't. So if you're a skeptic today and you hear these things and you still say in your heart, yeah, but... There's nothing more to say than you are willfully rejecting the truth and hardening your heart against him. You don't believe because there's not enough evidence. You don't believe because you don't want to. That's why. So don't harden your heart. That's what I would say to you. Verse 44 says, Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And I want to tell you something here that Jesus teaches us the principle of Christ and all the scriptures. Now, we're here to exalt Jesus Christ. That's what we're here to do. We're here to exalt him. We're here to talk about, make much about him. And one of the things that will absolutely enrich your faith and your Bible study and your enjoyment of the Old Testament uh, to, uh, is, is to look at the Bible with an eye, opening it up, looking for Jesus Christ. We make a huge mistake if we think that Jesus doesn't show up until Matthew's gospel, two-thirds of the way through the reading of the Bible. No, Jesus is present in every book of the Bible, perhaps every page of the Bible. And I want to just share a couple of examples with you just in the book of Genesis, which is the first book of the Bible, some of it taking place thousands of years before Jesus. Actually, pretty much all of it, thousands of years before Jesus came. First of all, in Genesis 3.15, what's it say there? It says that when, God, uh, when, the, when the Adam and Eve had sinned, right, and God was pronouncing the curse upon the serpent. He was sending Adam and Eve out of the garden. You know what he said to the serpent? He said, cursed are you. You'll go on your belly. That's what he said. And he said, and you will be at enmity with the seed of the woman. And he will crush your head and you'll bruise his heel. Now think about that. Now you, I don't know if you heard that right. The seed of the woman. Not the seed of the man. Now you know the first thing I think of right there is? Should be virgin birth, shouldn't it? The virgin birth, the seed of the woman. And who is it that crushes the head of the serpent or the devil? Because this is the devil here. Is Jesus Christ at the cross, isn't he? At the cross, when they thought they were crushing him, he was crushing the devil, wasn't he? Under his feet was what he was doing. He was providing a way for Adam and Eve to make it back to the garden to be with God. And so from the very beginning, Jesus shows up in Scripture. Then you make your way to Noah's Ark, don't you? And the wickedness had, had waxing all over the land, right? And the people, their thoughts can, on evil continuing. God decides he's going to judge the whole world. He tells Noah to build an ark and to preach repentance. And nobody comes. There's one family, eight of them, load up into a boat. And the judgment of God comes upon the whole world. And who was safe? And where were they? They were in the ark. And I tell you today, right now, the judgment of God was going to come upon this world. And the next time he's going to do it, he's going to do it with fire. And you know the only safe place? It's not a boat built by, with wood. It's in the ark, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only safe place. And if you are in him, you'll be safe from the judgment of God. See that? Or how about Joseph? What about Joseph? Joseph goes and his brothers, they hated him, didn't they? So what did they try to do? They tried to kill him, didn't they? And uh, they faked his death. They, 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 they were going to really kill him, and, and one of the brothers talked him out of it, so they faked his death. Took his coat, uh, put animal blood on it, told his father he was dead, and they sold him off into, into the Ishmaelites, who took him to Egypt. He went into slavery. He was in jail. Awful things happened to Joseph. One great thing happened, though. Uh, he saw that there was, God gave him the dream, the vision, that there was going to be seven years of plenty and seven years of famine. And Joseph 
makes his way up the ladder, becomes a second in command. He, he goes and he stores up a, all this food uh, in the first seven years when there's plenty of it. And in the next seven years, he feeds people and saves millions of lives. Well, he's feeding one day his brothers who sold him come by, right? And they, and they see Joseph. And Joseph comes to them and he says to them this, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. See, there came a time when the Lord Jesus Christ was taken by wicked hands. And what men meant for evil, God meant for good because Jesus bore your sins upon that cross, right? What men meant for evil, God meant for good. Don't you, don't you just love what Jesus has done? Oh, and then you get oh, to the Psalms and there you see the sufferings of Jesus begin to take stage. Psalm 22 reads like Jerusalem, like the Jerusalem newspaper the day after Jesus died on the cross and it was written 900 years before he lived. Uh, it, is, it foretells the words that Jesus would say from the cross. It depicts his suffering. It even records the words of those who mocked Jesus and gambled for his clothes. You go to the book of Micah and it tells you where the Messiah would be born. And that Isaiah 53, when you read it, gives a detailed account of the suffering, of the crucifixion, of the death of Jesus and what that death would accomplish. And it told it 700 years before Christ even suffered that death. And all of it is what we're saying here today is simply this. All of biblical history centers on one man, one towering figure who rises above everyone else. He is often in the background, and yet at the same time, he seems to be the main character in the story, and that's because he is. It's all about Jesus. It's all about the redemption that he brings through his suffering and death upon the cross. It's all about his reign and his rule. Give praise and honor to his name today. Getting a little wound up there for a second, ain't I? But I, I tell you, man, Jesus in the Old Testament, just seeing him there, just that is it's the best. It's the best. Our Savior, he is the one, isn't he? Verse 45. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. That's enough for just a minute. He opened their minds to understand the scriptures. See, there's something, church, here, essential in the way of salvation, this simple verse. Christ opened their minds to understand the Scripture. We can see that understanding is granted to men by God. That's, that's given, it's a gift. If you understand that God that sent the Savior to die for you, and that's all you want is Jesus, that's a gift from God. He opened your mind to understand that. There's an inability to spiritually see what you must see in order to be saved. In Ephesians, the Bible describes us as being dead in our sins and trespasses. Romans 3 says of men, that no, of men that no one seeks God and that no one understands. And so it's remarkable when you talk to people who understand the gist of the Christian gospel message and they say, sure, I believe that happened, who in actuality haven't been saved because they haven't had their eyes opened by God. See, there's more than just an intellectual assent for salvation. There is a change that occurs once he does this for, for you. And, and this, is, this is how you'll understand it. You'll, you'll be talking to people that have had the experience of listening to sermon after sermon for years, and, and they get nothing out of it. They're just there, and, oh, that was nice, and all that other stuff. And then one day, it just seems like that the pastor's getting better. They wonder, you know, has he been taking some extra Bible classes? <laughs> And the fact of the matter is that it wasn't the pastor that had changed. It was that God was beginning to work upon their soul and give them an understanding that only comes from them. They had been reborn by God so that they may hear and believe. And we see this happen in the Bible and other places in addition to Christ doing this for his disciples. You remember the Apostle Paul makes his way to Philippi and he goes down. There's not even a synagogue. There's not enough Jewish, people to have, Jewish men to have a synagogue. And he goes down by the river and he finds some women sitting there, uh, worshiping and he goes and he shares the gospel with Lydia. And do you remember what the Bible says right there? It says that he opened her heart to understand what was being said and she was converted to Christ. In 1 John 5, 20, John tells us, we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true and we are in him who is true in his Son, Jesus Christ. The psalmist declares, open my eyes that I may behold the wondrous things out of your law. See, you have to have your eyes open. If you have believed upon Jesus Christ for salvation, I can tell you with complete confidence that your journey didn't begin when you woke up and one day and said, I think I'll be a Christian today. No, it does not work that way. God, by His sovereign will, regenerates men and women, which means to say that He opens their minds to truly understand the Scriptures. And if by chance you happen to be hearing the voice of the God in the Scriptures today, do not ignore it. Call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. 
Verse 46 and 47 there says, to them, it says, He said to them, Jesus did, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in His name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. It's the last thing we'll deal with today. Now we see that Jesus give the disciples the purpose for which they have been saved and the purpose of the church even today to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Church, I'm going to tell you today, we haven't been assembled together to bring about social justice, although the church has often been the agent of social change. We don't exist as an assembly to be able to better feed the poor, although the church has probably brought more relief to the poor than any other organization in the entire world. No, the mandate that we have been given is to go into the whole world and preach that Christ suffered and died for the sins of his people, that he rose the third day and to command everyone everywhere to repent of their sins and believe on Christ to the glory of God. It's that simple. You have come today to hear an Easter message, haven't you? That's what you came to hear. You didn't expect me to talk about bunnies and candy and the Easter dinner that's waiting on you at home, did you? You didn't expect that, did you? And maybe you would do well to ask this uh, question. You know, what must I do to be saved? Because here's your Easter sermon, Christ died for sinners and was raised the third day. And here's your answer to what must I do to be saved? Repent and trust only in Jesus Christ. You say, oh, oh, well, but pastor, I, I, I believe. No, no, listen to me. Repent. Turn from your sins and believe and trust in the work of Jesus Christ and in Him alone. Renounce all your good works, all your good deeds, all your pitiful moralism. Stop counting on, the, on the, that you don't do anyone harm and, oh, I, I don't do anything wrong to anyone. I, and, and, and then stop keeping that as a way to justify yourself. Don't trust in your baptism, in your church membership. Don't trust in your family's good name. Admit that you are a sinner with no hope before God on your own. That your righteous deeds on your best days are nothing more than filthy rags to God when it comes to your salvation. And believe only in Jesus Christ for all that's in you. Turn away from your, way, your wicked ways and turn away from the idols that you've served. From money, from sex, from comfort, from leisure from power, from success. Renounce all those things and value Jesus Christ above everything that's in this world. I am not telling you to come and add Jesus Christ as a part of your life. You know, I'll make him a part of my life. No, I'm telling you, to make, I'm telling you here today that what Christianity truly is is make Jesus Christ the focal point of your life and nothing else. Don't worry about what others will think of you because in Christ you have found the most valuable thing this world affords. He's worth selling everything you own just to have him if that's what it would cost. He's worth losing every friendship that you've called dear in your life just to be known by him. He's worth being an outcast in your family just to have him call you his friend. Don't leave here today having valued the things of this world, the relationships of this world, or the family that you have above the Lord Jesus Christ because he is the only way in heaven and earth for you to be safe from the terrible judgment that God will bring upon all people who will die in their sins. And God, in the richness of his mercy and grace, has sent the Lord Jesus Christ to die on your behalf and to pay for your sin and to satisfy God's wrath for it. And his mercy, he still waits for you. See, the fact that you draw your next breath that you take right now is an act of God's mercy towards you. The fact that you're not in hell this very moment is the direct result of his unparalleled graciousness for you. And he waits for you. How long will you wait? How much longer will you wait? I don't know. I don't know how much longer he'll wait for you and you don't know either. And that's why if you hear the voice of God in the scriptures today pounding in your heart, telling you to come and trust in his Christ, you better not ignore it. You better not because you'll be guilty of profaning what he's done and shedding his blood for sinners. So let me ask you something today. Will he save you? That might be what you're thinking here today. Will he save me? Yes. He will forgive all those who come to him in repentance and faith. But preacher, you don't know what I've done. I don't care what you've done. All I know is you're a sinner. You don't have to tell me what you've done. I can tell you what you've done. You know what I can do? I can take the Ten Commandments and show you how you've broken God's laws. So you don't have to tell me what you've done. I know you're a sinner. And I'm telling you today that if you repent and trust Jesus Christ, if you say, oh Lord, I know. I know Jesus will forgive me of my sins. I know that as great as my sins are, His mercy is greater. 
I promise you today, on the authority of God's word, not my authority, on the authority of God's word, he will assuredly forgive you and give you eternal life. Do you understand that today? So don't wait another minute. Come and give everything to Jesus Christ. He's worth, listen, this is the last word I say. He's worth everything or he's worth nothing at all. One of the two. Which is it? You, you, you don't have this choice of he's, he's a little bit of my life or whatever. I'm telling you, he's worth everything or he's worth nothing at all. Come to the Lord Jesus Christ or stay away, right? If you're going to keep your, your good works, if that's what you're going to do, you're going to stay in those things and all the things I've done. Well, just stay away from Jesus. No, if you say, though, if you'll say today, oh, I've got to have Jesus because I'm a sinner and God's judgment's upon me. I'm telling you today, he'll forgive you. Come, come to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's my appeal to you. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, what a great Savior we have in Jesus Christ who will save to the uttermost those who will come to Him by way of faith. I know we've gotten worked up today, but what a great Savior He is that He's conquered death, hell, and the grave. He is risen, and because of Him, we'll rise too. And Lord, if there's someone here today that's a sinner that knows they've been either playing church or they've been avoiding Him, but you have knocking on them. you're knocking on them, Lord. You're beating down the door of their heart. With every heartbeat that they feel, they feel that, oh, I must repent and trust Christ. Lord, don't let them leave today without having come and confessed Him and repented and believed only in Jesus Christ. This we pray in the blessed name of our Savior, Jesus. And amen. It is an unassailable fact that Christ has risen from the dead. Will you stand with me and sing hymn number 159? And as you stand and as you sing, if Jesus is calling you today, do not stay in your pew. You come and I'll pray with you as we stand and as we sing.